Irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Greetings to all of you listening around the world, and a warm welcome as we bring you another edition of the Answers for the Family radio show. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and with me is my co-host, Dr. Matt Polachek. Dr. Polachek is a nationally recognized expert spokesperson on mental health and substance abuse use disorder issues. He utilizes his experience and expertise to lead the Betty Ford Center Outpatient Services as its director. Now, if you're a regular listener, thank you for joining us once again. And if this is your first time, please make yourself comfortable as we bring you Answers for the Family. Now, each week, this show will address issues such as locating a runaway teen, family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, and so much more. Now, having over 30 years' experience working with families in crisis, I've been fortunate to meet and work with some of the top professionals in many of the helping fields who are all working to make this world a better place for all of us. You know, Alan, most people know sugar, carbohydrates, they're not really good for us, but many of us don't realize exactly how bad they are or that they're the two leading causes of our current health crisis. Well, I know that uh, what Grain Brain did for wheat, our guest's new book, Sugar Crush, now does for sugar, revealing how it causes crippling nerve damage throughout the body, in your feet, your organs, and your brain and why sugar and carbohydrates are harmful to the body's nerves and how eliminating them can mitigate and even reverse most any type of damage. And our guest today, Dr. Richard Jacoby, is one of the country's leading peripheral nerve surgeons. He specializes in progressive damage to the nerves that often result from diabetes. He's treated thousands of patients with the condition over the years and has successfully treated many patients who would have otherwise had to have amputation. And Dr. Jacoby is one of the co-founders of the Scottsdale Healthcare Wound Management Center and is the past president of the Arizona Podiatry Association and the Association of the Extremity Nerve Surgeons. Dr. Jacoby, welcome to Answers for the Family. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, um, you know, I mentioned earlier in regards to uh, what grain, gra- grain Brain did for wheat. Uh, I can also tell you it's what Grain Brain did for my own diet. And um, Matt and I were just talking about uh, we've got a good feeling that uh, Sugar Crush is going to end up doing the same thing to our diet as it relates to sugar. So just as a background, what, give us a background. What is Sugar Crush and how danger, dangerous really is it towards our lives? Well, it's extremely dangerous. Um, the premise of the book is um, about nerves and the effect that sugar has on nerves. Although the book, when I got into it, was um, kind of startling to me because the literature that I was reading really never supported the fat hypothesis. And I'm now writing a second book that's going to amp up that message even better. Surprisingly, the um, the amount of sugar that we have in our diet is not known by most people because it's in the form of high fructose corn syrup, and that's in a liquid form, and 80% of all the food in the United States has it in it. And so it's very pervasive, it's an insidious process, and I was listening to your introduction on, on kids and family, and I think this um, schizophrenia, um, uh, ADD, all these things are really part of this process as well, although I don't really talk about that in, in my book. I talk about the nerve damage that, uh, that most people know about, diabetic neuropathy, but I've also expanded that to Alzheimer's, autism, and ALS, and to name a few. So yeah, it's a big problem. Well, now you just mentioned the the uh, Alzheimer's uh, cancer and autism. Uh, you know, share with us a little bit about the link between these uh, you know these diseases. Well, I trained with a fellow by the name of Lee Dillon at Johns Hopkins about twenty years ago, and he had um, developed this theory of multiple nerve compressions in the lower extremity. He's a plastic surgeon by training, and is also a professor of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins, and 
I met with him at, at a lecture, and he invited me down there to uh, train. And I'm a podiatrist, so we see a lot of diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And he developed this technique back in the early 80s. And a patient had said to him, Dr. Dellen, you fixed my carpal tunnel in the wrist and the ulnar tunnel, which is in the elbow. Why don't you fix my feet? And he said, well, that's not done. That's not a nerve compression. Then he thought about it and said, well, wait a minute. If the wrist is a nerve compression, maybe that is a compression neuropathy as well. So long story short, I went back to him after doing a couple hundred cases and we had excellent results, uh, about 80 to 85%, which is better than anybody in the world. And I said, there must be another uh, biochemical pathway related to sugar. The premise that he was working on was, and I don't want to get too technical here, but the Maillard reaction, which is kind of like slowly cooking your nerves to death, and the polyol pathway where sugar gets inside the nerve and swells the nerve. And I thought, well, there might be another pathway. And he said, well, why don't you figure it out? And Well, that's what this book's about. I contacted some of the best scientists that we have in the United States, and there are many at Harvard and Stanford in particular. And I saw this article in the circulation journal by a fellow by the name of John Cook at Stanford. And he's a cardiologist by training, has a PhD in vascular biology, and he had a specific molecule that he was working on in the year 2004 called asymmetric dimethyl arginine. I know that's a big word, but basically what it does, it blocks the blood supply to the nerve. And um, I had texted him about my theory, and he called me on the phone the same day, and he said, that's interesting, why don't you come up here and we'll, we'll talk about it, which I did. I measured my patients with this molecule, and I started to see the link between Alzheimer's uh, temporal arteritis, things that seemed that would not be correlated to peripheral neuropathy, ALS was one of them. MS was a big marker for this disease as well. But then I went back to Dr. Dellen and I said, you know, I think this nitric oxide pathway, which is mediated by asymmetric dimethyl arginine, may be part of the, the issue. And, and, and it is. Um, so then I went back to Dr. Cook at Stanford, and I said, maybe all these diseases that we're seeing are all interrelated and and connected. So let's take the the leg and the lower extremity, because most people think of diabetes with diabetic peripheral neuropathy, and it really is a compression neuropathy of multiple nerves. So you lose your feeling, gets burning, tingling, numbness, and then eventually you lo you lose all your feeling and you get a blister, gets infected, bone gets infected, osteomyelitis, and you get an amputation, about 100,000 of those a year in the United States. I said, well, why would the biochemistry of nerves be any different in the leg and not be the same in your neck or your arm or anywhere else in your body? And that's what this theory is about. It's the same disease. So MS is the nerve in your neck, the vagus nerve, or even autism which is the hypoglossal nerve in the in the base of the brain. So I put these together, and that's why I wrote this book. I'm not 100% uh, done with the research, but it makes so much sense. And when you really look at the American diet, these diseases really never existed before. They were very, very um, scant, and very few people had, had those diseases. Autism, a case in point. One in 68 births now last year, and 15 years ago, it was 16 per 10,000. It's the diet, and that diet is sugar, and that particular sugar is high fructose corn syrup. And are you seeing, so, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. but are you no, seeing a, a similar, you know, in countries that have lower sugar intake, are we seeing, you know, less incidences of these things? We did, but now since we're exporting our diet around the world, the incidence of diabetes and related diseases are skyrocketing, except for some countries that do not allow high fructose, or excuse me, do not allow genetically modified uh, grains into their diet. That's what makes this uh, such a complicated subject. Uh, grain brain is a perfect example. Um, the grains are inflammatory and they spike your insulin. But the grains are also doubly um, 
a problem in the United States because we use genetically modified organisms to make that wheat and corn and uh, that's what is the problem like in Italy the autism rate is very low they do not allow um, genetically modified grains into their diet and their diabetes is lower in those countries so it's a complex question but it is about nerves and it is about inflammation and scarring of those nerves by this process well, and you know, I just read an article where they were they were describing the the Amish diet, and they were saying that the Amish have a much lower rate of autism, a much lower rate of of Alzheimer's, a much lower rate of cancer, uh, and that they have a much cleaner diet. Uh, I mean, so have you made any connection between their diet uh, and and ours? Not in uh, that subgroup of people per se, but I will tell you there's a um, fertility doctor here in Arizona. It was a friend of mine, and he also believes what I believe, and he has over 900 births with a clean diet preconception. And of those 900 births, he has zero autistic spectrum disorder. So, Zero. so what it sounds like you're insinuating is that even if someone were to have had a high sugar diet, if they start making changes in their life, um, they can turn this around? Is that a possibility? Definitely. Depends on what stage you're in, of course. In the early stages, what we call small fiber neuropathy, that's reversible. When you get into large fiber, which means into the motor fibers that uh, control our um, different functions, then it's probably then it becomes a surgical problem. So let me make it see if I can make it simple. I tried to in the book, but it's a tough subject to make very simple. The think of sugar as an inf inflammatory uh, um, chemical, and I try to break it down and to think like this: if you poured nice oil in your car it would make it very slippery and the parts would work very, very nice. Mm -hmm. That's what butter is, that's what oil is, that's what fat is. 50 years ago, we were told not to eat fat and we changed the oil in our body to omega-6 fatty acid oil from vegetable oils. That's inflammatory, that's like pouring sand in your engine. It causes inflammation, friction. Friction is inflammation. So the parts don't work. The body repairs inflammation, friction, by putting down scar tissue. And scar tissue is what I believe, and the literature, literature is starting to show us, is how these tunnels through our body get smaller and smaller so that the artery, nerve, and vein can't function. They get choked off. So the end organ, doesn't matter if it's your brain or your toe or your gallbladder, it doesn't matter. There, the, not going to function as well. Let's take the eye. Very, very common in diabetics to lose their eyesight. Well, the optic nerve is going through a very tight tunnel, and if it gets inflamed, the blood supply to the optic nerve gets interrupted, so the eye is not functioning. The problem I see with doctors, they're looking at the end organ from the different, from the wrong point of view, so macular degeneration or an ulcer on the bottom of your foot we're trying to treat the end organ damage rather than getting around to the other side of the equation, prevent the poisoning, which is sugar, and treat that side of it rather than the end uh, phase of the disease. That's just a different viewpoint. Now, if you go back through the literature and look at MS, like the word, multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. I mean, you're really just describing the effect multiple sclerosis in Latin really means uh, white spots that are on the brain and the spinal cord. That's an effect. That's not a cause. The cause, in my opinion, is sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and I get into the biochemistry of how that happens, and the literature is pretty clear of how it happens. It's just not being looked at that way in the treatment of these diseases. So is there a specific, because, you know, um, I, I've been told fruits are high in sugar and stuff like that. Is there a specific difference within the types of sugars that we're having? There is. But bottom line, all sugars have pretty much the same effect. They spike your insulin. And that's why grains, 
uh, crackers, anything that's not fat is going to produce a insulin response. Even meat, by the way, produces a little bit of an insulin response. So let's look at the different sugars, though. It was thought that glucose was really not any difference than uh, different than uh, fructose. The difference: mm-hmm. fructose goes through the liver and causes a hormone called leptin to be turned off. And this is really key fundamental problem with the obesity epidemic. There's a good book called Fat Chance, Dr. Lustig wrote, and he clearly demonstrates that that hormone leptin is turned off. And that's the one that says you're, you're full, the satiation switch. So if you're eating a lot of high fructose corn syrup, you're never full. You're never satisfied. You can continue eating. And that's why we have enormously big people in the world, um, in the United States now, because they're never, never satisfied. If you eat fat, that switch turns off and you would say, well, I feel great. I just had a, an egg and, and some butter or avocado or some mm-hmm. good fat. And you say, I'm not hungry anymore. And you'll stay thin. Well, if if there's so much information about how bad the you know the cornstarch or the you know the, the fructose is, why can't we get our country to or our bureaucrats, I guess, to to make changes? Excellent question. I asked that question to myself. I don't know if you, you fellows remember Willie Sutton back in the fifties and sixties. He was a bank robber. Oh yes. Okay. And, and Willie robbed banks, and he was in and out of prison. And one day, one of the uh, police officers said, Willie, why do you keep robbing banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. <laughs> and that answer is... <laughs> that's where they put the money. <laughs> it's pretty simple. So why is this country, the greatest country on the planet, in, um, addicted to sugar? Well, I asked that question. And I also ask the question, why do politicians go to Iowa? Why do they go there? And the answer is, that's where the money is. And when when I said that, as I say that to a lot of people, I said, Iowa? There's no money in Iowa. Oh, yes, there is. Called the Farm Bill. That's one trillion dollars. One trillion, not a billion, trillion dollars. So you go to Iowa, and I think this is the political debate we have on uh, right now. Bernie Sanders says, I don't want your money. Trump says, I don't want your money. But everybody else takes the money, and that's how they get elected, and that's the establishment. So let's see where some of that money goes. Trillion dollars, that's a big number. First of all, it goes to the National Institute of Health, and that's where the papers are written. Well, you're not going to get funded if you say anything contrary to the corn industry. just not going to happen. And number two, the food stamp program, which is now called the SNAP program, is an enormously large subsidy for the corn industry. And the military food, uh, the the school lunch program, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I think we don't have truth in labeling. We have the problem with the genetically modified foods, and we're all addicted to sugar because everybody in the country is interrelated to it. And then you have the pharmaceutical industry. Every one of these diseases has a pill that will allow you to can keep eating sugar. When I say that to people, they say, well, that's, that's not right. Well, think about it. If sugar is a poison, which it absolutely is, why would you make a medication to allow you to eat more sugar? Because that's all the medications do metformin, glipizide, even insulin. Stop eating the poison. You don't need any of those medications. Well, now I just ruined the pharmaceutical industry as well. Right, and unfortunately, the money's not in prevention, it's in treatment. You got it. That's the answer. And everybody's making money off of it. The biggest employer in every town in America is a hospital. That's an indictment right there. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. So your biggest employer is the hospital. It's sucking out all the money from our country, and that's the political debate that's going on right now. I think that's what Bernie sees, and that's what Trump sees. Something is rotten in Denmark, and it's sugar. Now, the solution for it, 
Bernie would turn us all into a communist state, in my opinion. We don't know what Trump is going to do, but I believe they're both correct. All right. Well, you, you mentioned earlier a little bit in regards to fat. Uh, you mentioned as far as you know, they started trying to take that out of our diet, saying that that was the evil thing. Uh, I mean, did that? I mean, apparently we're saying then that the 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 beef and pork industry wasn't a strong enough lobby compared to the the, the grain and pharmaceutical industry to be able to fight that. So apparently they got tagged as the bad guys. So tell us what some of the mis, uh, the misconceptions are of fat uh, and, and, and how food labeling has now become so misleading. Well, I asked that question to the Institute for Human Origins, which is, um, the, um, which is based here in Arizona now, um, Don Johansson, and he was the discoverer of Lucy. And Lucy was the first primate about three and a half million years ago. And I asked that question, what did what did our ancestors eat? And the answer is, gorillas eat carbohydrates. They eat an abundant amount of carbohydrates. When we started eating more insects and fat, then we changed from primate to a, a upright primate, which is a human. And the foot got down on the ground, um, we call plantar grade. We were able to walk about. In order to walk about, we had to have a small rib cage. And with the invention of fire, the we were now able to eat meat and fat at an abundant rate. Well, that required a smaller alimentary canal because you have to digest that quickly and get it out of your system as opposed to a gorilla. So your rib cage would be smaller, and you have a waist, and you can walk on all on two feet, and your hands are free, and we have a bigger brain. Fat does that. Now, about 10,000 years ago, we started to domesticate animals, and also we started to eat wheat. That started the disease process. But only about 50 years ago, maybe 60, in the 70s, we introduced high fructose corn syrup into the diet. At the same time, the high fructose corn syrup was introduced, we vilified fat. And what I mean by that, we, we cooked the books. Ansel Keys was a big investigator, long story, but bottom line, he lied about his research. The pharmaceutical companies came in and said, oh, fat is bad, so therefore cholesterol must be a bad fat, which is not, it's, cholesterol is not a fat. And we are on statin drugs and a thousand other different drugs. Fat is good. Sugar is bad. If you eat fat, you'll never be hungry. You'll be thin, and you won't have any of these diseases. Now, the counterpoint to that, yes, some of these diseases have a genetic predisposition, and you'll get it no matter what you eat, but not in the prevalence that we have today, and that's called epigenetics. So fat was never... A bad thing to eat, but the industry branded it as as bad based on bad science, and it's continuing to be told the same story. But it is absolutely not true. Um, heart attack, cardiovascular disease is not caused by fat; it's caused by sugar. Two thirds of the people that land in a hospital or have a heart attack have an elevated sugar. 50% of those people have an elevated cholesterol as well, but the other 50% have a low cholesterol. Cholesterol has nothing to do with heart disease, period. So what is the biggest difference then between the, the corn syrup sugar and cane sugar that, say, comes from Hawaii? Well, first of all, they're, they're both bad. So cane sugar, um, now here's the interesting, the table sugar that you have on, your, on the table, mm -hmm. That's sucrose, and that's a, bi a, a disaccharide. And when it's a chemical name for uh, double sugar, it's half fructose and half glucose. Glucose is not sweet. Fructose is sweet. So this, the table sugar that you're thinking is cane sugar is really fructose, but high fructose corn syrup is pure fructose that they then manufacture, by the way, with uh, a catalyst called sodium hydroxide, and that's made with mercury. So mercury breaks the corn down so you can extract the, the um, sugar out of it, and 
there's a couple papers that were written that 80% of the high fruct- or 80% of the food in the United States that has high fructose corn syrup in it, a third of that had mercury in it, which is neurotoxin. Mm. So there's fundamental differences between these two sugars. The glucose is burnt in energy instantly when you eat it. Fructose goes to the liver and interferes with that molecule we were talking about, um, leptin. It also um, has something to do with uh, ghrelin, which is another hormone in your stomach. So these are, these are the hormones that make you hungry constantly. That's the big Mac attack. You're never right. hungry. You're never full, even though you just stuffed yourself. Well... You know, on a scale of one to ten, because I think one of the things we have to realize is is that we're not going to go in and and get America to cancel out a a one trillion dollar industry. But what we can do is try and and slowly replace something. And that's why I was asking about the cane sugar because what I've noticed is is that and although I don't drink sodas, I in observing them I noticed that. Now you look at the cans and it'll say made with real cane sugar. We went through this process to where I remember looking at cans and they were saying, you know, you know, no sugar, no sugar added because, you know, they thought that was going to sell. Now saying that it has cane sugar and not fructose sugar, they're, maybe they're believing that, that that's going to help it. So on a scale of one to ten, if we were going to try to to move in a direction you know, if if one sugar is a is a ten, what is the other? In other words, start. You know, how can we start moving in the right direction? Well, I think that is a move in the right direction. We are now recognizing that uh, sugar processed into a form of high fructose corn syrup is not as good as the naturally occurring. That's true. Both are poison, by the way, <laughs> but that's less of a poison. But now, I think once you you start to do that, then you're going to question the very basics of the logic. Why would a little bit of poison be better than a lot of poison? Well, that makes sense. Uh, here's a good segue to that. Arsenic is a poison. Mm-hmm. Uh, we wouldn't take a, a drug so we could eat more arsenic. Arsenic um, is the drug of choice for, uh, for, su- or for murder because uh, it tastes sweet. That's why that's why you can get away with it, and it works insidiously. So you just keep adding more and more arsenic. And interesting, both of the arsenic and high fructose corn syrup and uh, interrupt the um, same um, vitamin, thiamine, which is a B vitamin. And over time, you will kill yourself with both. It's just how you want to kill yourself. You want to do it fast and sudden, or you want to do it slowly. We, if you're selling drugs, you want to sell. It, you want to do it slowly. You want to keep the person alive as long as you can, and um, then you have a good business. And ex- but sugar is, sugar is, is sugar is a poison. And in what and with the high fructose foods? Just excuse my ignorance, but what are some of the main kind of uh, foods that do have such a high levels of high fructose? Eighty percent of all the foods in the United States have high fructose corn syrup in them. Eighty percent. So it's almost. Uh, it's almost impossible not to eat it if it's manufactured because that's what makes it taste great. The, I assume you guys are sitting in a chair right now? Yep. You could, ta- you could take that chair and make it into a fine powder, add high fructose corn syrup to it, and you would say that's the greatest tasting chair you ever ate. <laughs> <laughs> so just put it in that context. It's going to make anything taste great. And it's cheap. And it's liquid form. So, and you can put it in the shelf for, you know, 20 years. Uh, It's not a real food. So we're talking about, I think, the demise of the country with the resources going down a rat hole to a problem that could be corrected. Now, back to to the lobby and the elections and all the rest of it, you and I know that's not going to change, except for the fact that the country takes all their money and puts it in the health care, it'll be self-correcting because we won't have any money left for anything. Uh, and people people then will get away from the sugar. Well, now but it's you, going to take a cataclysmic event for that to happen. Now, you, you've mentioned what our country has done. Are there any countries out there that are 
doing a better job of this? There are countries doing a better job, but, are, but more countries taking our food. Uh, the last statistic I looked at is that we have 350 million diabetics worldwide now. Um, I'll give you an interesting story. When I was first asked to look at this problem, it was 1981, and the Surgeon General of Taiwan asked me to come over there and take a look at the country because they had some diabetics, or they thought they had a diabetic crisis. And the Surgeon General's name is Luke Chu, and he's a great guy. Um, uh, he was a four-star general. He had a Ph.D. in pharmacology as well as an M.D. degree and he was head of uh, the Diabetes Association of Taiwan. So I went over there, and I went all over the country. Basically, I couldn't find any diabetics. They really had very few, uh, but they never had any prior other than the type 1s. So now they were getting type 2s. This is 1981. The first fast food restaurant was 1979. So in two years, they already noticed a change. And who was getting the diabetes? the rich. The rich could afford, quote unquote, better food, Western food, and they were getting the disease. Now, China and Taiwan are just as high or maybe even higher in the diabetic sense than we are because they're eating a Western diet. It's that simple. All right. We've got a, a listener question that has come in. And again, we want to thank them for bringing these in. Uh, this one reads, I have been reading a few pieces here and there about eliminating sugar for dietary reasons to lose weight, but I had no idea how expansive the damage can be in relation to disease, especially the Alzheimer's and cancer epidemics. I have purchased your book and I am awaiting its arrival, but in the meantime, can you tell me, um, uh, have you actually seen conditions like this reversed when sugar is eliminated and how long does that generally take? Excellent questions. Well, let's let's answer the cancer question. I found this amazing is that uh, Otto Warburg, who got the no Nobel Prize in, in medicine in 1933, 1933, and his um, hypothesis was that fructose, in particular, caused cancer. 1933, Nobel Prize. So he looked at a very basic experiment. When he fed cancer cells sugar, they prospered. When he took it away from them, they produced ketones, and it killed them. So all you have to do is not eat sugar, and the cancer cells cannot live because cancer cells are unable to um, prosper on ketones, and that's now called the ketogenic diet. 1933. It's amazing. So, yeah, it's shocking. Well, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, uh, I want to kind of get into what parents can do and what some of us can do to start, you know, fighting this this sugar issue. We'll be right back. Founded over 25 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis, West Shield specializes in resolving adolescent issues that negatively impact the family. From preteen to young adult, we are experienced and qualified to help. We offer solutions which include referrals to a network of top professionals internationally that we work very closely with in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, and psychiatry. Our in-home crisis intervention care program helps to stabilize families and bring effective resolution. We are supported by our licensed investigation company that enables us to offer legal and expert services for locating runaway teens and more. Our therapeutic transportation services help to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely provided transportation to specialized schools and programs with unmatched experience and success. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services is the best solution when your family is facing personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585 and let us help you. We're back with Dr. Richard Jacoby. And um, Dr. Jacoby, as a parent of a five-year-old, um, I definitely am guilty of uh, you know the high-sugar diets. But as parents listening out there, um, what are some specific foods that they could start switching their, um, their kids to? Well, for, for kids, it's really a double problem because they are addicted to um, mac and cheese and pizza. I think the two biggest uh, drugs out there. 
So when we go to a birthday party or any school function, we're going to have lots of carbohydrates on the diet. And so for a kid to not eat that is asking a lot. So what are some of the foods that could help counteract that? Basically, the foods that we've been told not to eat. Eggs, in the example. Egg is the perfect food. And I mean the yolk, which has the cholesterol in it. Um, That is what's good for nerves. Uh, Fat is good for nerves. So our nervous system would be calmed down tremendously by putting more fat in the diet. So I would say bacon and eggs, the all-American diet that we used to have in the 50s is the diet we should eat. Pancakes, uh, toast, jelly, all those things that we all grew up on, they have to be eliminated from the diet. Of course, the the Coke and Pepsi and that sort of thing is, is a given not to ever drink that. But the pizza and the mac and cheese, which is prevalent, that, that's a tough one to get off of. Um, there are some wheats they are non-GMO you can buy uh, if there has to be a substitute for pizza. Uh, I think that's, that's a good thing to do. Whole Foods has a brand that is non, non-GMO. But it's, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of choices out there for kids, unfortunately. Well, first of all, you had me at bacon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I can put bacon back into the diet, I'm happy. Um, you know, one of the, the well, but but let me let me go on to the issue of is in regards to sugar. There was a big thing in regards to sugar free or or sugar substitutes, and I remember some years ago going to a seminar. And the expert at the time who spoke on it was talking about, and I think it was saccharin or some of these other sugar substitutes, and said that that at the time in which this particular sugar substitute was brought to market and it was put in diet sodas when they were trying to remove sugar from it, he said that there was an increase in brain cancer of 600%. So... You know, you know, are these sugar substitutes as bad or worse than what they are being put into substitute for? I think so. Um, aspartame was the first one. That was it. Fact, that was it. <clears throat> it's interesting when the FDA first looked at that, it did not pass, and that was back in the seventies. And um, so they changed the. Um, the uh, committee they added another person that happened to be um the company who was trying to get that to market was gd cyril and donald rumsfeld was the president of that company ironically and they changed the uh, committee and it passed and that's how we got aspartame but aspartame and all those sugar substitutes are really a sugar molecule that are cut with a uh, chemical called formaldehyde which is embalming fluid and that's so it retains the sweet taste but it doesn't have the calories so that that kind of it took off because if you eat a, if you drink a diet soda there are no calories but it's really not the calories it's the insulin response and when you spike your insulin you will gain weight. So let's, let's spend a l- little bit of time on this basic fundamental biochemical reaction. The only molecule that can add fat to your body is insulin, the only one. So if you eat an apple, you're gonna, ins- you're gonna have an insulin response. You're gonna retain some of, that, uh, some of those calories and store it as fat. Now it's slowly absorbed with an apple with the fructose. But if you have high fructose corn syrup, it's instantly into your system. You're going to spike your insulin, and you're going to store fat. When you eat meat, you actually produce a little bit of uh, insulin, and you'll retain some of that as energy, but most of it is expelled. When you eat fat, there is no insulin response. You use the energy, and what you don't use is expelled. So you will look very thin if you're eating just fat, but people will say, well, it'll clog your arteries. No, you won't clog your arteries because the arteries are very, very smooth. Dr. Cook at Stanford gave me a good little analogy. When you eat sugar, it turns the lining of the blood vessel, which is called the endothelium, it makes it like Velcro. 
it makes it very sticky. So then the cholesterol sticks to the lining. That's a secondary invader. When you're eating fat, it makes it very smooth like Teflon. Nothing sticks to it. So your bacon, yeah. Now there's some other issues with bacon other than than the sugar hypothesis. But bacon is fine as long as it's a um, naturally raised uh, pig and pork. Unfortunately, in the United States, we feed all our animals grain, from chickens to beef to pigs. Uh, they will then produce omega-6 fatty acids, which are inflammatory. So if we ate naturally and uh, fed our animals the way they're supposed to be fed, like grass-fed, you would produce omega-3 fatty acids, which is anti-inflammatory, and you would be perfectly healthy. So what I, I, hear, what I hear you saying basically is when we're shopping for meats and stuff, we the, going for the grass-fed meats, we're in much better shape. And then what about fish? Same thing. Uh, fish have omega-3 fatty acid, fish oil. But now our oceans are depleted, so there are farms off the coast, and they feed them grain. They put the fish in a pen. They feed them grain just like beef. And we're getting fish. And we're getting the fish oil, but it's omega-6 fatty acids, not three. So it's inflammatory. So you're spending a lot of money on a fake product. Wow. But, I know, it, it sounds, it sounds uh, so ominous. But that's the problem. We have a uh, food supply that's been tainted, um, and we have a political process that aids and abets these people. And the cycle goes on. You know, and, and, I, and I've been um, so taught that you know fat diets are so bad for you, and you know steak with the cholesterol and all this stuff. Yet it's oh, untrue. Yeah. We have been educated into ignorance. The food pyramid is a construction of the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, and those people on that committee are just uh, part of the farm cartel. And if you're selling grains, you'll want as many carbohydrates on the bottom as you can food pyramids six to eleven helpings of grain a day even if you love grains that's a hard thing to do but if you did follow the pyramid exactly i could get you up to 300 pounds real quick just follow the pyramid and that's our government telling our kids what to eat and then turn around and say hey you're fat and by the way you're not exercising enough one bagel has let me give you an idea how to read a label one bagel has 48 uh, grams of carbohydrate. That's all you need to know. Just look at the total carbohydrates, not the added sugar, but the total carbohydrates. Divide by four. Four into 48 is 12. That's how many teaspoons of sugar you're getting in one bagel. That's a tremendous amount of sugar. Take you two hours jumping on a trampoline to expend the energy that you just ate. It's impossible to lose weight if you're eating carbohydrates. Impossible. Unless you could run all day long. And I do see those patients in my practice. They're, they're my, I call the real sugar hogs. They run all day long so they can eat as much as they want. That's the carbohydrate loading hypothesis that was put forth in the, um, in the 70s. And because we were taught that fat was bad, and the substitute of a low-fat diet, to make it taste good, you have to add sugar back into it. So it's really that simple. Well, we have another um, question or comment that's coming in, this one via email. This one, this one reads, bravo, we've been focused on chemicals. We are ignoring the sugar in, in all of the organic and non-GMO processed foods. I am a nutritionist that has been preaching this to my patients for the last five years. It is wonderful to have a, in quotes, credible book to hand my patients that is written by a mainstream physician who actually is willing to speak out about this major threat to our food well I appreciate that comment um, it's it's not making me a lot of friends other than my <laughs> patients <laughs> um, I get a lot of pushback I've done a lot of radio interviews and 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 um, I've done some really I thought credible magazines and I'm not going to mention the name of a couple of the magazines but after the interview, 
they said this was a great interview, great information, and we're not going to publish it. Oh, because yeah, because they're advertisers. Right. When you look at the magazines, it's Coca Cola, it's uh, it's the Pillsbury Doughboy, etc. Exactly. Every food out there is. I mean, look at Starbucks. Starbucks is a case in point. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to up. They'll be on my hate list. Mm -hmm. uh, Starbucks does extremely well because their coffee, in my opinion, is very bitter. And the only way to make it taste good is put sugar in it. And then that's how they make their money, uh, by putting lots of different sugars in it. Um, my point was sh uh, with uh, coffee, and I, I happen to be a coffee drinker. I put butter in my coffee. Hmm. That's how I stay thin. That's the biggest trick you can do. You put butter in your coffee, you'll never be hungry. Hmm. Wow. And But there's no money in it. Well, for the food manufacturers. Well, that's a great point. I'm I'm not a coffee drinker, but because to me coffee is bitter, uh, but I do like butter. So who knows? <laughs> I, I may take it up now to get that little caffeine. Fix. I think it's terrific. I mean, when I first started doing it about five years ago, um, and I, I I love coffee and I love butter. So when I mixed the two together, it was heaven. <laughs> I can't wait to get up in the morning. Does a couple things. Number one, it gives tremendous energy. Number two, you'll lose a pound a day. And the third thing, which is kind of odd, it gives you a an alertness that you can't imagine. That morning fog is gone in seconds, absolutely gone. Can't wait to get up in the morning. When people eat carbohydrates, they are sluggish in the morning because they're fighting that insulin response, and they just feel rotten. Now, I'm not a, an expert on their neurologic issues in the um, in the brain by any measure, but I think that's part of the part of what you're seeing out there in all these um, schizophrenic problems and the highs and lows because insulin is a major major influence on the brain, and we get our energy from fat, not sugar. We convert to glucose maybe a teaspoon at any one time in the bloodstream is all you need and you convert instantly from fat to sugar to get the energy, but you do not spike your insulin. Spike your insulin, you're gonna change your mood, and then, uh, you're, and then you're gonna have a crash, and then you get depressed, and the only way to get feeling better is to eat more sugar, and it's the cycle goes on and on. And I think that's what you're seeing with a lot of these things that you're talking about, um, <clears throat> with these behavioral problems. So it's a huge problem for the US and the world now, and unfortunately, sugar, which is so delicious in so many foods, is causing our health care epidemic, what, pandemic. One of the, uh, the, I, the parts of the book I thought was really cool was the ability to be able to take a quiz um, to kind of gauge your levels. Will you briefly talk about that for us? Yes. Um, I, I think that there's so much misconceptions that m most people I talk to, they say, well, I'm not, I'm not a, sugar, a sugar hawk. Well, yes, you are. Take the quiz. A lot of things that don't seem to be interrelated or really are, like migraines. Uh, I see that in younger people. They have migraine headaches. That's really an inflammatory issue with the uh, lining of the blood vessels and the uh, brain, and that causes uh, severe headaches. Um, then trying to relate these different itises, as I call them, and start to add them up, and then you realize you are a sugar hog, and your diet is to be suspect. And um, so take the quiz. You'll see that um, most of the things that we talk about there are mundane symptoms, but they really are the precursors to diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And, and um, in my new book, I have... Um, a sentence let me go back to Judge Scalia our Supreme Court Justice who just passed away he was a diabetic but probably did not have a lot of symptoms leading up to it that he didn't think were associated but I'm sure if I looked at his history he had hypertension, he was overweight he probably had headaches, he probably had mood swing changes which is terrible if he's a Supreme Court Justice we wouldn't want to get him on a bad day but he may never have had chest pain. Mm -hmm. And I have my chapter, I was writing at the time that he passed away, that dead is a bad symptom. 
You got that right. And what I mean, yeah. <laughs> that is a bad symptom. Most of these other symptoms are noisy, like the peripheral neuropathy, the burning, the tingling. They're bringing your attention to the fact that you're being poisoned by sugar. It's attacking the autonomic nervous system. But in the heart, you may never have a symptom until you have a sudden cardiac arrest. That's why I say dead is a very bad symptom. Well, Dr. Jacoby, and, and you're absolutely right. That is the worst symptom that any of us can get. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, this is such a great subject. We would love to have you back on. Again, for anybody out there, I highly recommend the book. It is sugarcrushthebook.com. Go to the website. Check it out. Um, change, change your diet. Change your children's diet. And you will find that it will, it will help you in so many ways. So, again, Dr. Jacoby, thank you so much uh, f- you know, for being with us and for taking the time to write this book and, uh, and educate all of us. It was my pleasure. Excellent interview. All right. Thank you. And for everybody out there, tune in next week when our guest will be Jack Meyer, culturally, cultural visionary and award-winning documentary film producer and author of the new book, How the Age of the Dominant Male is Over, The Future of Men and Masculinity in the 21st Century. So again, everybody, be good humans out there and be with us again next week on Answers for the Family. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza, right here on L.A. Talk Radio.